In a bone-chilling revelation, the final message of the death row inmate, Scott Dozier, sheds light on the sinister psyche of a double murderer, as he disturbingly embraces his impending demise. The harrowing account unveils the twisted anticipation of a condemned individual, offering a rare glimpse into the depths of human evil. Here's a glimpse of the unsettling journey of a man who found solace in his own impending death, unraveling the enigma of a life steeped in darkness. My life is no longer worth living. I cannot move five yards without some asshole telling me where to go or not go. There are 48 cells for 48 of us on death row, and I have to live around murderers, talking about the finer points of raping someone. I was convicted in Nevada of killing a 22-year-old man and cutting up his body. This man was a fellow criminal. Society now treats me the same as those fucking monsters. By the time you read this, I will almost certainly be dead. Some say I'm courageous, others that I'm a coward. Unlike me, there are people on death row fighting tooth and nail to stay alive. One old guy's been here since 1979. I'm the only one putting himself up on the chopping block. I've had to continue to smile and be courteous to people I consider reprehensible. I have a granddaughter, just turned two. But I've refused to see her, ever. I remember my wonderful grandfather and I don't want my granddaughter to know her grandfather only across a prison table. That would be heart-wrenching. A grandfather-grandchild relationship should be interactive and cool. But I cannot show her anything like I experienced, exploring cars and exploring trees, and that sort of thing. When I'm dead, I'd rather she imagines who I am, not remembers me as that man she had to meet inside a jail. I've explained to my family I'd rather be dead than this, and my family believe me. It's like having cancer, I've told them, and not wanting treatment. I hate the claims in court hearings that I turned out this way because I was abused as a child, or there were suicides in the family. My favorite grandfather did kill himself. I take responsibility for my own actions. And, actually, I had quite a decent childhood, then a short spell in the US Army, and a short marriage. There's a photo in my death row cell of me with a beret, and my young wife. I accept the unknown of death rather than the known of this life. I may just be walking myself into a shitstorm, but I've always been one to walk toward things. I'm told there could be great things after death. Although I'm an atheist, I'm excited to discover what comes next. Probably nothing. I did everything possible to make sure the state of Nevada would kill me, but I did not like the way it proposed using dubious fatal drugs. Rather than be strapped to a gurney and injected, I'd far prefer to have been shot by a firing squad and be able to look the executioner right in the eye. A firing squad is definitive and it's cheap. Yes, in here, I can do my art and watercolors. Yes, on most days, I can make a couple of phone calls and listen to heavy metal. Occasionally I give myself a haircut and I work out. But that's not a life. What I miss is an endless list. I cannot have any intimate relationships. Everything in my life is a bare minimum. Now my last moments are arriving. But I will not be saying much, whatever the means is that I exit this world. I'm not going to give anyone the satisfaction of telling what really happened when these two guys died. I don't owe it to the state and I don't owe it to the two men I've been convicted of killing. I do feel genuine sorrow, though, for these men's families. The state has the right to kill me, if you fuck with some entity bigger than you, you get fucked. I chose to live outside the law. Ever since high school, I chose to make money, which they say is the root of all evil, by selling drugs. That gave me freedom to pursue my lifestyle. You may find it hard to believe, but I've always had a strict moral code. It's important to me that no one's ever accused me of killing children or women, only other criminals. When you are operating outside the law, you have to act disproportionately to others who also operate outside the law. It's the only way to protect yourself. What bothers me is the state claimed I had stolen $12,000 that he'd brought to buy some drugs. Not true. I would never steal. 
I'm not even sure why I'm doing this final piece. I'm not campaigning for any reforms. Nothing is going to change. But I do know this, I've never been one to hide or cover. I believe you must stand on your feet, not live on your knees. Now I, Scott Dozier, say, let's get it done. Goodbye. Angela Drake, Dozier's ex-wife shared her experiences with Scott Dozier in a compelling account. Despite living in deplorable conditions, she says he remained resilient and steadfast. Drake shed light on the remarkable character of Dozier, highlighting his resilience and refusal to complain, offering a unique perspective on life behind bars. He fought against all odds and found strength and resilience in the face of unimaginable circumstances, leaving a lasting impact on those who crossed his path. Dozier, who had waived his appeals in 2016, was convicted in 2007 for the gruesome murder and dismemberment of Jeremiah Miller, 22, at a Las Vegas motel. Additionally, he was convicted in Arizona for the 2001 murder of Jason Green, 26. Dozier's criminal history included two separate murder convictions, highlighting the severity and brutality of his crimes. Dozier, scheduled for lethal injection by the state of Nevada, faced delays due to legal challenges surrounding execution drugs. A pharmaceutical company's motion halted the execution in July. Previous postponements in November 2017 raised concerns over pain caused by lethal injections. Dozier expressed readiness to die and was placed on suicide watch after the delay. Disturbing legal documents revealed that Dozier made multiple suicide attempts, including trying to acquire a lethal drug through prison mail. These revelations emerged in a lawsuit challenging Dozier's placement on suicide watch and his deteriorating conditions in isolation. His lawyers argued that the unconstitutional treatment, such as the denial of recreation time, communication with family, and access to legal counsel, contributed to his decline. It was also disclosed that Dozier managed to obtain razor blades and received mail containing instructions on self-harm methods. The filings exposed the alarming measures Dozier took to end his life and raised questions about the prison system's ability to protect inmates while maintaining their human rights. Would it be accurate to say that you were in a good mental state when you were put into mental health observation, but they drove you toward a poor mental state? Without question, that's fair. Not to pull, only poor, but as bad as a mental state as I'd ever been in, in my life. All of my coping mechanisms were gone. They took every ability I had to deal with the situation. Yeah, it's as bad as I've ever been since I've been in prison. What do you hope for your son? What do you hope for your grandkids? That they're more successful in finding happiness and some degree of satisfaction and gratification in a life within the parameters, you know what I'm saying? That the ability, my inability to do that clearly is a sizable portion for me being here. And I, I, I just hope they're able to do that, you know.